Hello, my name is Leon Menezes. I'm a consultant radiologist and a nuclear medicine physician at the Institute of Nuclear Medicine at UCL and here in the Bart's Heart Centre. This series of talks from the British Nuclear Cardiology Society we've recorded is to give you the basic grounding in nuclear cardiology, the applications, the technology and the evidence. We hope you find them interesting and useful. Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Scully. I'm one of the cardiology registrars at Guy's and St. Thomas's with a special interest in imaging and heart failure, and particularly in nuclear cardiology. Now, I've had the pleasure of delivering this course uh, for the last few years with Leon, and uh, this is perhaps one of the, the more in-depth uh, talks that we, we deliver on the topic. And I'm going to talk to you now for about the next half an hour or so on diagnosis and risk stratification uh, as it pertains to myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, or MPS. Now, uh, special thanks to Steve White, who actually delivered the first iteration of this talk many years ago with Leon, and I uh, have rather shamelessly stolen some of his slides, and you'll see he features in one of them as well. So th many thanks to him. What I'm going to talk to you about really is pro hopefully provide you an overview of its diagnostic potential uh, as an imaging technique, and by that what I mean how good it is at estimating the probability of having coronary artery disease. And then something about prognosis uh, for both abnormal scans and normal scans. And by prognosis, I mean how good it is at estimating the risk of death or myocardial infarction. And then finally, we'll hopefully touch on whether or not we can predict benefit from intervention using myocardial perfusion scintigraphy. Now, just to start off with a bit of a brief history behind the technique. Well, back in 1896, Henry Becquerel discovered these rays coming from uranium, which were later, about a year later, named by Marie Curie as radioactivity. And then in 1958, this chap you can see in the picture on the right hand side, Hal Anger, invented the first scintillation camera, which is a full 10 years before M mode echo, 20 years before 2D echo. 30 years before stress cardiac MRI and indeed some 40 years before cardiac CT. So we have a wealth of evidence backing up the technique and in fact many of the newer imaging modalities have actually been validated against myocardial perfusion scintigraphy so that's important to bear in mind as we go through these few slides. How does it fit into the guidelines? Well I think we're all very familiar with the new iteration of the NICE guidelines, which is not that new anymore, back in 2016, which really has a central role uh, for CT coronary angiography. Um, however, functional imaging does still have a key role to play, particularly as you can see there in patients where CT coronary angiography has shown coronary artery disease of uncertain significance or is non-diagnostic. Okay. It also has a key role to play in patients with known coronary artery disease, and really the NICE guidelines don't uh, differentiate which functional test. Uh, but I think hopefully we're all now using whatever we have at our disposal in our local area and really just utilising our local expertise. But I would strongly urge you to, to remember these are our guidelines. Uh, and in fact, a lot of this is going to depend on the patient in front of you. I would argue it's probably not appropriate to be sending an 80 year old gentleman with known hypertension, high cholesterol and diabetes for a CT coronary angiogram. You can already predict the report that's going to come back to you, which is going to say, this thing's lighting up like a Christmas tree. Please consider an alternative imaging modality, uh, which means it's really a wasted uh, trip to the hospital for the patient uh, and, and indeed uh, wasted scanner time and, and potentially a small amount of unnecessary uh, radiation for the patient. So really tailor your test to the patient in front of you, which I think we all do, uh, and obviously to the uh, expertise uh, that you have available to you. Now, where does it fit within the guidelines in Europe? Now, this is the sort of newer 2019 uh, iteration of the guidelines, which is sort of similar to the previous ones, where there's sort of this key central role in this intermediate pretest probability for functional or ischemia testing. Okay, if it's a sort of low likelihood of coronary artery disease, you may feel no diagnostic tests are required or indeed a CT coronary angiogram is required. If it's a very, very high, you may be going straight to invasive angiography. Uh, if you're somewhere in the middle, then perhaps this ischemia testing. And this is where this sort of idea of pretest probability, which used to be a feature of the old NICE guidelines, is key. 
And this is where the Diamond Forester plot, which we've all seen before, has slightly changed a little bit here, as you can see, to include dyspnea in the new, uh, new uh, guidelines. Um, but whereby anyone with a pretest probability of over 15%, which is the dark green areas that you can see, uh, non-invasive testing uh, is likely to prove most beneficial in, in those patients. And just to remind you, uh, typical chest pain has all three of those features of constricting discomfort in the chest, neck, uh, jaw or arm, so it's that characteristic cardiac sounding uh, discomfort or dyspnea, as you can see there. Um, but it's precipitated by exertion, relieved by rest or GTA within five minutes. And atypical is only two out of those three features. Okay. Um, the light green areas that you can see there, where the pretest probability is five to fifteen percent, diagnostic tests may be considered based on modifiers. And some of these modifiers you can see here, whereby if you've got a normal exercise ECG, that's obviously reducing your likelihood. If you've got an abnormal exercise ECG, that's increasing your likelihood. An abnormal resting ECG, for example, uh, obviously coronary calcium on a CT scan and uh, and sort of a risk factor profile there. And this is all feeding into sort of our clinical decision making around the likelihood of coronary artery disease. Disease. And then here's a, a sort of final picture here from the, the, the guidelines whereby you can see this low likelihood uh, on the left hand side, uh, they're suggesting going direct for CT coronary angiography, where you have a higher clinical likelihood, perhaps non-invasive testing for ischemia uh, is, is appropriate. So talking about diagnosis now, so this is how good are we at estimating the, the likelihood that you have coronary disease using myocardial perfusion scintigraphy. And, and actually I'd like to say we're pretty good. Um, and, and just a key concept to get our head around before we begin, and this is something I've always struggled with, so I'm holding my hands up here. Um, the idea of sensitivity is this idea of how good we are at detecting uh, the proportion of patients who are truly sick. OK, so sensitivity, the SI in the middle, that's how good we are at detecting the sick patients, OK, i.e. the true positive rate that we get. Specificity is, is on the flip side of that. That's how good we are at identifying the truly well patients, so the patients who truly don't have the disease. And the FI in specificity, how good we are at identifying the fit patients. So this is the true negative rate. And this is a sort of key concept as we're going through the next slides. So this is a large meta-analysis that was done with nearly three and a half thousand patients in the exercise stress and uh, nearly two thousand patients in the vasodilator stress and this is giving us an idea of the pooled sensitivity and specificity of the technique. It's important to realise that actually the, the studies are quite old now between the 1990s and early 2000s so Techniques have improved, imaging modalities or, or sort of scanners we use have improved, radiopharmaceuticals, well we've moved away from thallium which is a number of these studies as you can see in the background. Um, so actually we, we, we're probably better than that now, I'd hope we're better than that now, but the sensitivity wasn't bad, so 87 to 89 percent, so that's pretty good, pretty respectable, very comparable to other modalities. The specificity, however, so our ability to correctly identify those patients without disease could be better. So the mid-70s is, is not really where we'd want it. So how can we improve upon that? Well, I already alluded to one way. We've moved away from thallium, which is one of the older radio tracers we used to use in favour of technetium. And you can see already in that middle column, this MIBI or SESTA MIBI is a technetium based tracer. That's shown significant improvement in the specificity already. We gate our scans, so we've actually get some idea of regional wall function. And it's not really regional wall motion, it's more thickening, but it's akin to what you might see on echocardiography. And that gives us an idea of whether that area is alive or dead, and we'll talk about that in another slide. We can move the patient to have a look to see if that area of reduced counts is actually reflective of artefact. Has it moved with the patient, therefore it's likely to be artefact? Or actually is it still there in the same place? And, and if it is, then perhaps it's genuine, perhaps it's real. And then we can do what's called attenuation correction, which does improve specificity from somewhere in the sort of 70s as we've seen to in the 80s. And I'll show you a slide on that in a second as well. This is what we were talking about, gating the scan, so giving us an idea of regional wall function or thickening, if you like. As I say, just to remind you, this is not really endocardial motion, as we see on echo. This is really reflecting increased counts in uh, systole. And hopefully in the middle slide there, you can see there is this reduced counts in the inferior wall in the vertical long axis, so in the top image, which is reflected there on the short axis image as well. But if you look on the right-hand side, you can clearly see 
that that wall is moving very nicely. And the key is there, if you saw those images in the middle, you'd wonder if that was there at rest and stress. You wonder if that was an infarct. Okay, but actually looking at that wall moving nicely, it's clear that it's not dead, and this may reflect subdiaphragmatic attenuation. Perhaps this is a gentleman who has quite a large gut, uh, and therefore, really, this is more attenuation, i.e., more artifact than real. Okay. The other thing I mentioned that we can do is we can actually move the patient. And here you can see the top row reflecting a supine position for the patient and then the bottom row, the upright position for the patient. And you can see the short axis images across the top uh, running from apex to base as you're going from left to right. And then you can see the vertical long axis and then the horizontal long axis on the bottom. And hopefully I can convince you, albeit subtle, uh, there is some reduction in counts in the basal and mid anterior wall that you can clearly see on the left hand bullseye. However, once you move the patient and you move them upright, you can clearly see that that's now disappeared. So by definition, this is uh, attenuation, likely to possibly be a breast attenuation in a lady that's now moved, having moved the patient in an upright position. I mentioned already attenuation correction, but this is, uh, so attenuation is the loss of counts due to the absorption in the body or scattering. And it's, much, it's a much bigger issue in PET than it is in SPECT, because in PET you need to detect two photons simultaneously, so this coincidence detection that you've heard about already. And therefore, if there is attenuation, it's going to be a much bigger issue. So CT is, is obligatory in PET, hence it's always abbreviated to PET-CT. So what, here, what we do here is we use a transmission acquisition and whereby you're either acquiring it simultaneously using an external gadolinium source or separately by CT done soon after or soon before. Um, and thereby what you're doing is this transmission acquisition is used to construct an attenuation map and therefore you can use that to correct the emission acquisition. And this does improve your specificity as, as I've already mentioned. The other thing you can do is you can get a better camera um, and I'm glad to say as technology has improved we have done just that and this is uh, sort of an example here you can see this is my colleague Steve White I warned you he's going to be featuring one of the, uh, the pictures and this is a cardiac only uh, CZT or solid state camera so cadmium zinc telluride is CZT and a number of departments in the UK and a large number of centres in the US now have these and this is as I say a cardiac only scanner um, but it does provide better energy and spatial resolution which allows you to trade off reduced scanning times and, uh, uh, and or reducing the dose you inject into the patient and therefore the radioactivity the patient receives and overall you get a much better image quality and I'll show you a picture in a second. So here you can see on the bottom row, this is a standard SPECT image acquired over 15 minutes. The middle row is the CZT uh, new solid state camera acquired over 5 minutes and then on the top over 3 minutes. And hopefully I can convince you that the bottom row uh, image quality isn't quite as good as the top two. So what you can do is you can trade off injecting a lower dose and imaging for perhaps fractionally longer. So you can say, for example, instead of going for a 3 minute image acquisition, you could go for a 5 minute image acquisition but inject a little bit less and therefore just depending on your workflow and your patient population you can actually reduce the radioactivity these patients are receiving while also reducing scanning times. The other thing actually has much uh, uh, better image quality and increased sensitivity and specificity is PET perfusion. In the top right hand corner you can see the ROC curve for a large meta-analysis of over 17,000 patients comparing SPECT, CMR and PET and overall uh, PET seem to perform just a little bit better. Uh, overall generally a lower radiation dose with these PET perfusion traces, for example rubidium which has a very short half-life, you can do a rest and stress image over about 30 minutes. Uh, overall the uh, sort of radiation dose is in the region of about 2.7 to 2.8 millisieverts so very low. And finally the other thing you can do is you can take advantage of the improved myocardial extraction fraction that these PET tracers often uh, often have and here what I'm meaning is and this is a graph I know Leon has already shown you but as the absolute myocardial blood flow increases so with vasodilator stress or indeed uh, with dobutamine or just simple exercise Unfortunately, many of the conventional contrast agents tend to uh, tail off, i.e. their myocardial uptake doesn't augment uh, with the blood flow, so it's not a one-to-one -one linear relationship. Now, one of our uh, PET traces, so oxygen-labeled water, does do that, but the image quality, unfortunately, isn't as good as it, as it could be. But rubidium, you can already see, does very well, and so does ammonia. And actually, with a slight correction for this tailing off, we can quantify myocardial blood flow as well, which again improves our, our sensitivity and our specificity, and also hopefully avoids this sort of 
slightly mythical issue of balanced ischemia. Just looking at some of the more recent data supporting myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, well this is the PROMISE trial looking at 10,000 symptomatic patients who were uh, randomised either to anatomical or functional imaging uh, and there was no uh, improvement in clinical outcome using one modality or another over a median follow-up of two years. So it really doesn't matter the test uh, you, you choose, just as we've said it depends on the patient in front of you and what is available to you and the expertise in your local area. And just looking at the CE Mark II trial, so the later iteration of CE Mark I, this was looking at 1,200 symptomatic patients. And uh, what was interesting is patients investigated by cardiac MRI or myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, both groups had lower rates of unnecessary invasive coronary angiography within 12 months compared to NICE guideline directed care. There was um, also reassuringly no difference in major adverse cardiovascular events, and by that what I mean is cardiovascular death or MI between the two groups, uh, and that's between cardiac MRI and myocardial perfusion scintigraphy. So if we move on now to talk about prognosis, so how good MPS is at estimating risk to the patient of, for example, myocardial infarction or indeed death. And actually, given the evidence base behind MPS, we're pretty good at doing that. And this was a review of 14 retrospective studies. I'll show you the numbers in a second, but actually showed that if you have a normal study, that's a really reassuring thing. However, if you have an abnormal study in any way, you have a 12-fold increase in non-fatal MI or death. And I'll show you the numbers. The numbers are, unsurprisingly, given the, the history we have, huge. We're talking 12,360 patients here across a range of studies uh, and a range of follow-up from anywhere between 10 months and 275 months. And uh, as, as we've seen, there is this 12-fold increased risk if you have an abnormal study compared to a normal one. I think it's always important in cardiology and in any specialty to have an appreciation for the sort of warranty period of a normal scan, uh, given that we frequently see patients back in clinic a, a sort of year or two later with similar symptoms, the GPs referred them back, and we're not sure how reassured we should be given they had a normal scan a year or two previously. Well, that very much and perhaps unsurprisingly depends on the patient in front of you. If you have a 50-year-old gentleman who managed an exercise stress myocardial perfusion scan with no history of coronary disease, not diabetic, no history of CKD, then you can be incredibly reassured. And the white bar you can see here is one year, the black bar you can see is two years, and these are the event rates. And so they're incredibly low if you have a normal study and you're a low-risk patient who's managed to exercise. That changes as you get older and indeed you have a history of coronary artery disease or you're diabetic or you're, you have known CKD or you simply can't exercise. Those risks are still low but not quite as good as if you were a very, very low risk patient. So that's something important to bear in mind. Now we can go one step further than just the qualitative assessment that we do uh, in myocardial perfusion scintigraphy whereby we're comparing uh, sort of the rest and stress images and giving a sort of qualitative assessment. We can actually be semi-quantitative about it whereby we score each AHA segment as you can see in the top right hand uh, corner of the screen. We score each of those for uh, relative perfusion or tracer uptake where zero is normal and four is absent and you can see this sort of gradual declining scale from one with mildly reduced to moderate, severe to absent. If you tally up that score at rest, you get a summed rest score, which gives you an idea of the extent and severity of infarct. If you tally that score up at stress, you get this idea of infarct, which was present there at rest, plus ischemia, which is added, it, added in at stress. And then if you subtract the stress score from rest, you'll get an idea of this different score, which gives you just this idea of extent and severity of ischemia. And that's where this idea of ischemic burden comes from. So if we just look at a screenshot here from a Hermes workstation, if you look in that middle column, you can see the polar maps there. On the top of that column, there is a stress polar map, and just underneath it is the rest polar map. And you can see overlaid that is the AHA segments, and actually what you can hopefully visually see, so when we're doing this uh, qualitative assessment that we do, you can see that there are absent counts in the LAD territory. So the apex, apical, uh, anterior wall, mid-anterior wall as well. There are absent counts there. And actually if you're comparing rest with stress, there's very little reversibility, so very little superimposed ischemia. So this is what you would say is a full thickness uh, sort of LAD territory infarction. 
Now, if you wanted to quantify that using the semi-quantitative scoring system, what you can do is you can score each of those AHA segments that we discussed for zero being good, uh, intense tracer uptake, down to four being completely absent counts. Okay, and if I just magnify these up here for you, this is my attempt at scoring. And basically what it will do is if you're scoring it at stress, it will give you a sum stress score. If you're scoring, scoring it at rest, it will give you a sum rest score. And then if you look at the SD percentage, that's the sum difference score percentage. That's this idea of how much there is at stress that wasn't there at rest, i.e. what is the ischemic burden. And here you can see it's small at 3%, which would fit with our visual assessment. So just going back to some more of the data, this is uh, data from Hachamovich uh, from back in 1998. We already know that a normal study is reassuring and an abnormal study carries a degree of risk. But actually what matters is how abnormal the study is. With uh, sort of quite intuitively, but it's nice to see it in the data, that the more abnormal your scan, the higher the risk of both cardiac death and myocardial infarction. And just drilling down into that in a little bit more detail, that really only holds true, though, while your ejection fraction is above 30%. So there seems to be an interaction between ischemia and function. So once you have an ejection fraction of less than 30%, as you can see here in the bottom bar chart, the actual impact of ischemia seems to be less. And if you then break it down by cardiac death and myocardial infarction in the same study, uh, again, retrospective of 2,000, nearly 700 patients, Actually, ejection fraction, rather unsurprisingly, was the uh, strongest predictor of cardiac death, followed by SSS, which is some stress score, which we already know and uh, have discussed in the past. But the strongest predictor of myocardial infarction, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the sum difference score. So this idea of this ischemic burden, which again is, is, is very intuitive, but also reassuring to see in the data. Now, I think we'll all be familiar with the original Barry 2D study from 2009, which was overall a negative study in type 2 diabetics with stable ischemic heart disease who were randomised either to revascularization or optimal medical therapy and followed up for 5.3 years. But looking at the nuclear sub-study of the uh, 1,505 patients who underwent myocardial perfusion scintigraphy, what you can see is that uh, some of the MPS parameters are key to prognostication in these patients. And you can see here left ventricular ejection fraction, abnormal, percentage of abnormal myocardium, and indeed percentage of scarred myocardium did carry a significant degree of risk in terms of the rates of cardiac death and myocardial infarction over that follow-up period. Just thinking about what PET perfusion can bring to the table, and this is in terms of myocardial blood flow quantification and in terms of prognostication, we can see here that if you divide up coronary flow reserve into tertiles, the lowest tertile does much worse. And this was in 2,780 patients who were referred for PET and followed up over about 1.4 years. And if you were in the lowest tertile of coronary flow reserve, uh, which was defined as less than 1.5 uh, mils per gram per minute, then actually your risk of death was 5.6 fold higher uh, compared to the lowest turtle, which you can see there as the green line. So moving on to the final question, can we predict benefit from intervention? Well, the COURAGE uh, study, albeit an overwhelmingly negative study akin to the Barry 2D trial, uh, which again randomised patients to PCI versus optimal medical therapy and followed them up for somewhere close to 4.6 years and found no difference in risk of death, MI or other major cardiovascular event when PCI was added to optimal medical therapy. But the lovely thing about this study is there were 314 patients in a sub-study who actually had MPS pre-treatment and then 6 to 18 months post-treatment. Around about 159 of these patients, I think, had PCI within this study and around about a third of them had moderate to severe ischemia at baseline. And what they did show is that when PCI was added to optimal medical therapy, there was a more significant reduction in ischemia compared to optimal medical therapy. Now, the numbers are small. We're talking about a, a sort of nearly 3% reduction in ischemic burden compared to about a 0.5% reduction. But nevertheless, that was statistically significant. And what they also showed is that those patients who derived some benefits, so if you look at this cumulative uh, event-free survival, those patients who did derive a greater reduction in ischemic uh, burden actually seemed to do a little bit better. Now, this was a trend, and once it was risk-adjusted, that uh, the, the was not significant. But overall, that's a, a sort of trend that is important. 
And if we move back to the Barry 2D nucleus substudy in the 1,505 patients we just discussed previously, what they did also show, looking at the MPS one year post, was that there seemed to be a uh, reduction in ischemia with revascularization relative to um, optimal medical therapy. Now, going on a bit more about whether or not we can predict the benefit um, and, and this idea of ischemic burden. And this is the sort of seminal paper from Hachamovich back in 2003, which I think we've all probably seen, which showed that there is this inflection point at around about 10% uh, myocardial ischemia on the MPS, where you do better with revascularization if you have a greater ischemic burden above that cutoff. Um, uh, compared to medical therapy. And this is in a large number of patients, albeit retrospective, um, but without any prior myocardial infarction or revascularization. And then just similar work uh, by the same group, uh, sort of continuing on and more recently now, so larger numbers, 13,500 patients, lots of years of follow-up. Um, but looking here at the subset of patients with less than 10% scar, what you can see is that inflection point really still holds true of around about between 10 and 12.5% where early revascularization is associated with better outcomes if you have a greater degree of ischemia above that inflection point. There again is this seemingly this interaction between scar and ischemia that we've already seemingly seen already um, and, and whereby you can see the benefit that if you have no known coronary artery disease, if you know prior revascularization but no myocardial infarction or less than 10% fixed defect, you still gain benefit and you gain more benefit from revascularization the more ischemic you are. However, that doesn't hold true for once you have a myocardial infarction. Now, the definition of myocardial infarction in this study was a little bit loose, if I'm honest. It really was the occurrence of a prior MI um, reported by the patient or charted uh, by the physician. Um, and so it, it's, it's very unclear, but there does seem to be this interaction between scar and ischemia, where actually you, the, the presence of scar negates that impact of, of ischemia. And maybe that's akin to this severe LV dysfunction question that we saw previously. So in short, the therapeutic benefit of revascularization seems to be attenuated by a significant prior myocardial infarction. And patients with more than 10% ischemia but less than 10% infarct seem to benefit from revascularization. But then, of course, there's this new ischemia trial which was only published last month. And this is in over 5,000 patients, all with moderate to severe ischemia. Now, the MPS diagnostic cutoff for this was more than 10% ischemia. Um, ECHO had its own, cardiac MRI had its own, as did exercise tolerance test. What they did was they excluded significant left main disease with CT coronary angiography, and you can see the other relevant exclusions there, and they randomised these patients to early upfront uh, invasive management, be that PCI or bypass uh, or medical therapy, and there was no significant difference in rates of cardiovascular death, MI, resuscitated cardiac arrest, hospitalisation for unstable angina or heart failure at 3.2 years. Now, does this mean that we should be closing our cath labs and we just CT everybody and exclude left main disease and then put them on tablets and wish them all the very best? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure we're at that point yet. It's important to bear in mind that over a third of these patients, so 34% of these patients, had no preceding angina in the previous four weeks to recruitment. And despite the inclusion criteria of moderate to severe ischemia, actually 14% of uh, patients in the study had uh, either no or only mild ischemia on their imaging. Furthermore, around about a fifth of the intervention arm didn't actually undergo intervention and a similar number uh, of patients in the non-intervention arm actually went for cath and 15% of that group actually had intervention. What's also interesting, and it's it's quite difficult, I haven't managed to drill down into the, into the data yet, um, but looking through some of the old ACC and AHA presentations, there was the suggestion that there was no association between the degree of ischemia and all-cause mortality, but that there was a weak association between the degree of ischemia and myocardial infarction. Um, I think that will be key, and, and that will be very interesting from an imaging point of view to sort of drill down to in due course. I think it's a bit too soon. Uh, to be throwing out uh, sort of our, our other imaging modalities just yet. 
So finally, just uh, to sort of summarise, there is an excellent diagnostic accuracy overall with improvements in our imaging modalities, allowing uh, both reduction in uh, radioactivity and improved scanning times, as well as improved sensitivity and specificity. There is a very good warranty period from a normal scan, however, that very much depends on the patient in front of you. It's going to be very different with the 50-year-old with no other cardiovascular risk factors compared to the 80-year-old with CKD. Uh, and diabetes, uh, so bear that in mind. Um, and there is this interaction that we can see between infarct and ischemia, and indeed LV dysfunction and ischemia, um, but we also need to consider this ischemia trial that's just come out. And I'm sure it will be influencing practice in due course, but it's a, it's a bit soon yet to know which direction that's going to take. Thank you very much. Please comment below if you have any questions. If you found that interesting, please like and subscribe for more lectures. If you'd like to know more, follow the BNCS on Twitter and visit our website. Thank you.